So it's very worrying that Penn is sitting here, but at the same time, it's a great pleasure. <laughs> I hope it won't trouble you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's not really worrying, but uh, you know, you are very aware of the writer sitting in front of you. But I have really to thank you personally because that book. Uh, that I, I'll talk today only about part of it, um, but the book as a whole um, really not only influenced my thinking, it strengthened my thinking for many years and still so. Because I think, unlike many other people, that um, it's not only um, an epoch as you wanted to define it, you know, through forward that. Um, um, when the book was published, it was um, expressionist architecture was all, already kind of started being recognized, but not really. Um, I, for me, it was Rainer Benham. That I read the book not when it was published, not in the book that Peter we talked about, uh, 1960. Um, that kind of related, referred to the expressionist architecture very differently than many other historians before then. Uh, but you get a fuller story with the backgrounds and, and the pictures and the, you know that at the time there was no internet and no you know other sources. Today you click a name and you get something. It can be wrong as well, but uh, in terms of images it's, it's quite a lot. So uh, and I think the, the, the book touched me and you you see through my, my talk. Um, it really touched a nerve in me. Uh, I think uh, I became, I chose to be, I was a student many, many years ago, many, many years ago, and I think I chose to be a student uh, at the AA, you know, it was kind of a market, who to choose to study under and who will accept you, uh, because I think his expression is in heart as well, and uh, it kind of suits my thinking, and I came to London from uh, Jerusalem in the early 80s, and I'll refer to it, so I'll come to it, but I, I was raised in Jerusalem very differently, almost against my heart. And I was lucky to arrive in London, actually in the early 80s, where the, the whole attitude, at least the day, was very different, and I'll, I'll come to that. So, I'm, I'm mostly, I see myself as a practicing architect. I don't build a lot. I built very little, but I'm doing other things. I was academic for some years. I still wish to build more. I'm still trying to build more. Uh, and I have, of course, my architectural thoughts, my architectural thinking as a practicing architect. And um, so, I just. Okay. So, for me, Hans Pelzing is, is kind of the most. It, when I read the book first time, it was the most shocking character amongst the, the expressionists. And at the end, I think, still today, I admire him the most. And I guess I admire him the most because his architecture, his thinking, mostly, I think, is still very relevant to the way people argue. And uh, so um, the, the Gross Schauspiel House was an amazing uh, opportunity for Hans Pelzing in time where Max Reinhardt came to him as, as an amazing client and asked him to do this theater for the 5,000 or theater for, for the crowds, which at the time theater, uh, as mentioned in the book, you know, like in 30 years time, at the turn of the century, 19th century, there were like 300, about 300 theaters as buildings, buildings that go to the theater. And uh, in the 1926, I think, there were 2,500. So it was theater believed as a, as a, as a place to celebrate civilization. And, and the ambition of Max Reinhardt is really to bring the theater to the, to the poor, to the less educated, to the crowds. So, um, and Hans Pelzig, I think, did a miracle, which like something like in four months' time, he makes things happen. And because actually he was experienced in doing building architecture, it was, you know, he, he managed to do that. But it was 
quite an amazing thing. And when I read uh, what Peltic says, you know, let us, let us rather be impractical if we wish a ray of our creative activity to strike human soul. You know, it's a line that at the time, you know, even he felt kind of guilty, he feels through the line that he is impractical. But if, if I read it as, a, as an architect who raised as an architect in the 80s and still works as an architect, uh, I thought he was fantastically practical. So <laughs> it's a kind of, a, I understand the context of the time and I'll, I'll come to it there again. Now, this was a, an existing uh, framework building. It was a big market and it was a circus. And Max Oina decided that this is going to be the theater for the crowds. So um, the, the envelope was kind of changed. And the main thing was the inside. And you know, everything is black and white, but Pelsi put full on. So it was red in the facade, and, and the red was even kind of had a differentiation of, of, of coloration. It became kind of lighter towards the, the, the arches at the, at the top. And the, um, so, and then of course there were four four years. There were I counted as four. I think it was four four years, and and they were different for different type of crowds. So for the you can see the I, don't, I can't point anything, but if you look at the plan at the top, you see one column. It's the it was the elegant foyer, the double height, and then you could see from there the other foyer. You could approach to it from the other foyer, and then you enter the third foyer, and then you went further to the fourth foyer, which is on the left. I think it's on the left, and 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 then you walked into the theater. Now they were quite darker. There were different colors. There were kind of looks on so where he wanted to make this kind of very dramatic, very theatrical kind of experience. Uh, which was part of, of, of being ex expressionist, of course. And so we can see in the section here that, you know, a very straightforward section, but we can see the different foyers under the auditorium. And, and the, the, one of the amazing things was that the, the, he did the first time ever, like the kind of auditorium in a, in a, in a theater without the gallery that actually make it kind of smaller, still smaller. So he kept it kind of wide open and, and there was a feeling of this vastness. And then the, the famous dome that he was mostly criticized or hated or admired, I think, through the, the metaphor of the stalactite, which I'll come to it in a minute. It was kind of actually the highlight of it. And of course, the criticism came, but it was a bit tilted and it was kind of looked cheap. And, but it was amazing because, you know, being impractical, I don't know if it was so impractical because it works acoustically and also it works, you know, with the light and it gave the illusion of the sky and uh, uh, as Max Wernet actually gave us part of the brief, it, it had, you know, to, 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 to hold together the, the stage and the audience with like putting the, the actors and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the spectators kind of in the same, under the same sky, under the same zone. And it was amazing also, I think, he was a pretty amazing architect, I think, with amazing skills to make all these things happen and work together, and like all the spaces in between, which is like away from the dome. I think if you're an architect and you look at all the different pictures, try to understand the relationship between the photographs and the, and the section and the plan, it's, it was quite amazing. And, and the evidences were that the, the people, when they entered in November 1919, they were pretty amazed and they loved it. And it um, always made me think of, of uh, Frank Geary, how lots of people want to find, you know, faults and things. And when he did the Bilbao, I remember journalists from London came to hate Frank Geary doing the Bilbao a long time ago. And then he tried to find faults, the details are not good enough, but they came quietly and said it's amazing. The experience of this space is amazing. So I think for me, Hans Pelting was the first to make a kind of space, um, a, a, a condition which was much more sculptural, much more spatial, uh, with with kind of uh, the, the theater kind of going on from the foyer and the drama. Yeah, he did it as he wanted it, and of course, modernists would have done it differently. Um, so 
all the points that, that, that I refer to as expressionist architects, you know, I can see, of course, in this theater, and, and you know, the compulsion to expressiveness, which was criticized, is that same architecture as a great art, which was very much going with the time. And I think after the 80s, it was very much going with the time. Uh, for me, and I'll come to that. Um, strike the human soul, being visionary, being sculptural, uh, it kind of they raise high hybrid solutions, so it's like kind of different languages in a way, because like the four years it's very different from the dome, it's very different, you know, it's and, and the facade is also different, and but this kind of uh, um, exuberance it's also kind of very difficult. And uh, even like cons constructions are more than into individuality. This is the kind of uh, a line that for almost 100, nearly 100 years we are arguing about it and have different, in different times, different concerns about it. And uh, the concern with character, uh, Adrian Forty, a British historian, he said, you know, whenever the uh, uh, character is in technology, is hidden, kind of, he's always said. Uh, uh, ambivalent relationship, anyhow. So, so the, the 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 most elegant foyer was pretty much amazing, and and also like I, I didn't I didn't say that the foyers were darker. I said, but this was kind of in green, if I remember well, and then the the the, the, the under the dorm it was kind of shades of, of yellow. So it was also you came from somewhere dark, it was something kind of light. Like, so it's not only the it's the fullness. It's not only the the, the form, the amazing space, it's also the color and sort of the side effects. It's like everywhere he will, you know, make you kind of touched. And it's it's quite interesting as, as an architect to look at his perspective and to see the the, 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 the easiness in the way that you know how he captured like Petit was I think a genius like the way he drew, the way he painted, the way he was painting, he was an artist and became an architect. He 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 had the full understanding of how you, you actually make architecture as art, and I think we can see it also through these even very basic uh, drawings. Uh, capricious of form, this is a key sentence that I still hear it even in the digital architecture, I'll come to that, it's like capricious of form, you know, uh, I, I come from Hebrew, so capricious, I think it's in the way say caprizi, I don't know, like, but, but it's kind of crazy, it's kind of, you know, almost like mad, right? But I'll come to that too. And, and now this was before um, the water tower by Peltic was done before the, the theater. And I thought the theater is always an amazing start as we start with the book, you know, with the, with the theater. But, but we could see that, that as Pent mentioned in the book, like, and it's, it's hard not to see it if you look at the staircases in the middle. I mean, this could be copyable, this could be, you know, if you don't just forget what it is, just look at the gestures, look at the. You know, it could be a uh, Ginta you know, it could be, you know, so, so f for me it was kind of limited. So, wow, this is amazing. So, you know, if I, if, if as a, as a, you know, uh, nearly, I, I would say 100 years, it's not 100 years, but so many years after, I, I looked at it and I'm still so excited. This is amazing. This is, for me, kind of like unbelievable. And the fact that the world wanted to forget that, that's in the world the world still wants to forget that. Like architects who do this kind of stuff are still criticized and hated by the other half. You know, there's a kind of uh, to that. So, so this is a, another amazing strength. Um, it's a com com uh, combined powers between Max Berg and, and Hans Pelzig. In a way, though Max Berg did the design for the overall exhibition grounds, and and by the way, the place is still there. You know, I think I'm, I, I I discovered it still there not so long ago, and I'm, I'm, I must I must go there, and it's quite amazing. It's a UNESCO World Heritage and all that. But what is so amazing here for me in this project, the, the Hans Pelzig part is for me if I really see it as a young younger architect, you know, which is not a fair thing to do, but you know. Then there's not the second I look at it and say, okay, this is the, uh, um, the, the theater is still kind of old world. But Max Berg, um, uh, Centennial Hall was amazing. And this was before the theater. And I can see how 
Pelzig knew that this, you know, there's something here with the, with the auditorium, the way the seats go inside further and more. I think he did something very different in the theater, but I can see, I, I feel as an architect, kind of the influence uh, there. And, you know, also to think that the modernists wanted to erase this, this wanted to delete, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's quite shocking because they were so able in doing amazing buildings. So this is another thing to remember and I'll come to that too. So um, just another section, I think I have to hurry up a bit. Uh, another incredible um, the project for Salzburg was not built, okay, out and then. Bonotard. I'll talk less about Bonotard, but I think this uh, glass pavilion was obviously the, the most modernist of all as I feel it, because the, the, the aesthetic was the structure, there was not kind of two layers of two skins, the shell. Um, but even beyond, so it was kind of a, you call it post-expression, but it's an incredible building, and when you know on the internet, sometimes you see the color effect. That I don't trust the internet, but it's when just reading the, the description of the book, the, 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 the glass is double glazed, and the inner parts, the, the inner layers of the glass were in color, and there was again like an ambition to involve the, arti the other artists, and, and you know like the, the notion of of uh, um, collaborative kind of effort to, to make to bring the space like this. And for Bonotype, it was very clear that whenever he does something for the crop, whenever he does something for, for, for more than one individual at a client, you know, he wanted it to be made of glass, he wanted this kind of transparency, he wanted he had it, it was his kind of main kind of line. If Hans Belzig was talking about the cave and the tower and influence that along with that kind of uh, dimensions, uh, for Bonotype it was the transparency of the glass. And if you look at this, you know, I, you know, I think Forster was influenced by that. I think, uh, you know, and the, the glass, I mean, endless influence. But there was also the theater of it. So you walked in, then you had, you went down, and there was a whole waterfall. And it's amazing, kind of, again, to work on you from all kind of directions to feel the, the theater of, of, of the architecture. And, and Bonatan was the visionary per excellence, like, like, you know, the, an active as, you know, publishing the full list. And having this vision for, for kind of other life, and it's sometimes it's being held as kind of naive, not doing the right. But it's amazing how much thinking went there, and how much you know, uh, like a sort of uh, endless well that's spring, you know, comes in further and more. Um, I think I, I I should I should say more about history because again, as as as, as, as me as my subjective kind of interpretation of, of, of that amazing kind of world of drawing. And, and you know, he was not an architect, but he, he was, uh, I did science before, he did science before, and he had a kind of uh, ama amazing uh, uh, ambition as, a, as, an, as an artist. And, and as I said here, this is just one man out of many, many, but it's a focus on the thing that, you know, that retreats into self, was the very condition of his artistic existence, uh, which I can come to that. So, you know, like if there were a lot more points, a lot more issues that one can sum up kind of expressionist architecture, but I think it's like almost all of these issues, like the, the compulsion to expressiveness, the you know architecture as an art, as a, as a great art, you know, strike the human soul. Uh, construction technique kind of subordinated to overall impression, uh, concerned with power of tempo and with harmony, the sculptural effect, uh, hybrid solution, not being very pedantic about you know just going for the for the experience, uh, or even not a question of being pedantic but but enjoying the fulsomeness, uh, where the, the whole notion of industrial as manufacturing obviously was kind of the point I'm not touching enough on the on the whole world of fight between the crafts and the the, the uh, importance of the crafts versus um, technology, new technology. Still have huge arguments with the digital world, you know, like like I can take all these points and, and kind of talk about each one of them as 
things we're still concerned. So for me, I think the expressionist architect, architect, uh, architecture is, is kind of actually, was the beginning of something that as a phenomenon, so because it been, began as an epoch, but then it became like a, a phenomenon that, that is, we're, we're still arguing it, we're still doing it. And interestingly, um, well, not interestingly, but Gideon was kind of one of the, uh, you know, the historian that really critiqued expressionism and wanted to kind of, you know, said that the influence was not very important because he obviously pushed for the modernist uh, ideas and, and the uh, relevance of things. So it was all to do with kind of, uh, you know, not relevance to, to that day. And should we kind of, I'll come to that as well because then. For me, as a, I remember as a kind of a young architect, then, then further reading more about, you know, the, the you know, Benham reminds us, because again, as I think a lot of people here would think that modernism was for, for the function, and then kind of reduced to that. And, uh, and, and so Benham said, but you know, at the beginning, it was something else, but aesthetic was really part of the game, was really important, and, and um, you know, Mondrian's image and how he brought into architecture the whole kind of notion of what we understood as, as modernism that, that comes through aesthetics and aesthetics consideration and new aesthetics. And, and it was uh, Benham, for me, who put the fingers on three historians. He said, yes, there are historians. They eliminated the aesthetic bias. And he gave, Benham gave lots of reasons like during, you know, the war, you no know, one really didn't care about aesthetics, aesthetics, so they in a way, Benham convinced me that the apologies were against the protagonist and, and you know, change actually the whole scene. So many generations even forgot that, that was the, the thing. And the, and the zealous words of the artist in, you know, of Oral and Baumbach, that still, you know, uh, he, he, he was, these words were repeated. So the way uh, the, the expressionists were described, the messianic attitude of the expressionist seemed like mischief's caprice, caprice again, if not indeed inspired by the devil. Like these words were, were said all again in 1990 with a big finger by someone who was very admired by the, in the early, uh, early digital scene. And he said, digital technologies such as are hostile to all approaches that perpetuate the age-old myth of the capricious artist, artist like, you know, almost the same kind of words. Which I think telling us a lot about, you know, that we are still kind of arguing about most of the arguments that went there, we are still arguing them as, as kind of form, it seems as if form for a function kind of was winning. And then, you know, again sort of, the argument, you know, is it really not aesthetic there? Is it, you know, being really, being so pedantic about certain things and what's driven, you know, is it aesthetic there or not? But, you know, when I was in Jerusalem uh, studying architecture, as many other uh, young architects, you know, Christopher Alexander was kind of, you know, we had to study, I see some people kind of agreeing with that. And, and so this was uh, in 77, the book, but, you know, uh, it, it got to Jerusalem fairly fast. Uh, and uh, so kind of reducing the, the personalities, kind of giving no space for you as a personality to, to do architecture because it can be all about templates and, and, and prescriptions. And in a different way, one of the important uh, forefathers um, of the digital kind of architecture, John Fraser, <coughs> someone that I, sorry, have actually <coughs> tremendous respect for, but again, this kind of ambition to, to erase personality through different, different uh, uh, ways, or if it's new technology, if it's the computer design, if it's the you know, kind of new ideas borrowed from the scientific world, uh, from genetics and so on, sorry. So it seems to me that you know, if the 19th century there was kind of the universal style was you know, classicism, then you know, Art Nouveau was the kind of, I call it the short decade of, you know, people trying to raise their hands with kind of spatial uh, architecture, I call it more expressionist, more sculptural, more. And during the 20th century, it was a German expressionism, uh, it was pure the archaeology thing is a good example, it was kind of, people tried to raise their head above the puppet and kind of, 
and then and then in the 70s and 80s, you know, what then termed later as the deconstructivist. And interesting, in in the um, James Wine said that you know what the real change in architecture between you know in seven, during 77, 78 was the change that art, not design, the supreme mission of architecture. So we hear it again. It's not the first time we hear that, but it became very important, and it became you know when I was a student there that was it, and uh, and so you know. I assume you're all architects, but I might be very wrong. <laughs> so give the Dominic, uh, you will know. And so I, I just showed here like a few examples, like Frank Gehry or um, Co you know Co people Blau, all about emotions. And you know the content is emotions, they say, not function. And you know I hear this again. You know, heard, but you know all these architects, besides Frank Gehry, hates to be even mentioned next to expressionists. And I asked them why. You know, for me as a younger person, I know that if I, if I may say German expression, you know, at the time it was it was also about many other things, but there are still certain things that are so relevant to us. So why are you so, you know, but because I guess the reputation still, you know, no one wanted to be to be uh, to be under this kind of term because it might, you know, put them aside or you know, it might might not work. It might not work. For him, I think Zaha was very relaxed about it. <laughs> but what I call the second round of the apologies versus the protagonist, and this is this is me while I was doing my PhD. I said, but look, it happened again because Mark Wigley, again, with all the respect to Mark Wigley, he did this amazing exhibition about deconstructivism, and uh, he puts, you know, Frangiri, Kopimel Blah, Zaha, who were very kind of really trying. Uh, relate to emotions, to color, to space, to breaking the, the, the frame, to uh, with uh, and, and with personalities, each one of them, you know, they, they saw it as art, architecture as art, but architecture, and then put it under the same umbrella with Peter Eisman or Bernard Schumi. Bernard Wallace was kind of my idea, you know, their family now. And David Lipton was was weird. It was very strange and I remember as, as I just finished a, a, a year before and I said, what's going on here? And then the worst of all for me was he said in the catalog, not only that in the catalog he put all these drawings kind of black and white, took any character from it kind of purposefully, but then also the, uh, in the catalog there's this line, the disquieting is not produced by some new spirit of the age, the architect expressed nothing here, expresses nothing here. What does he want to say? What, you know, and, and again, it's the ring, so that's why your book, Mr. Brain, was so important for me, perhaps, in, maybe in the wrong direction, maybe in the right direction, but it, it was kind of, I still hear, I still hear the old conversations and that's why I was kind of, uh, um, you know, touched by that. And, uh, you know, again, sort of self-imposition, willpower, you know, is originality, because, you know, you know what, 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 what is the right thing, what is the wrong thing, and I think, I think actually, Frank is also maybe perhaps because he's the oldest, perhaps because he builds a lot, he just he just say what he thinks. But how there are some kind of quite good meeting. So so you know if and there was a lot of going on because if I don't want to I want to prove that I'm not self-imposing, I'm doing a good job. I'm not imposing my will you know, in the way people play and so so there was a whole kind of development of a non-determinist space which Popular and and Frangeri call it the open space and the open ended. So actually, it's not limiting, it's not imposing utility. And it, 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 it was kind of another hidden line, another answer. And, and of course, Bernard Chomin, again, you know, people who are, I actually quite admire, but if you read his lines, you know, no interest in any design of any form. And, and the arguments are still on. So here I put like, Few historians that I put in yellow the one who were not objective. You know, they changed the scene, they changed what's going on instead of reporting of what's going on. But everyone wants to be original. <laughs> everyone wants to add his personality in or whatever, or impressed by a different philosopher and so on. So the one in yellow, even Bruno Tsevio actually respected the and some of the expressionists and gave the recognition, I found him 
uh, deleting from history Carlo Molino because he thought he's not political enough. And Carlo Molino was an amazing Italian architect with amazing talent. And you know, like if you I don't know if you can see, but his monograph again it was um, published in 1987, and that's why I remember it so much. <laughs> How come? Because in the introduction. Uh, Giovanni Bruno said, blend Bruno said me that he deleted Carlo Molino from history. So it happens again and again. So we better watch them. So, you know, other historians tell us that it's, you know, we have, we, there is a kind of um, long term of respecting the, you know, what perceived what perceive as objective. So we have kind of scientific progress of 500 years. People trust the rationale. People trust, you know, mechanism inspired by, by kind of science and, and that push for rational thinking. Although also in science, people talk there's a lot of irrational thinking that leads to things. Um, of course, democracy's public opinion took over individual taste and power and architecture in the service of society and. As Ms. Mandura said, objective limits and non-subjective license. We know all that. The thing is, it's still going on. The, the arguments are still going on with the same lines. So, it was added one by a French philosopher as the critique on the hegemony of the eye and the sort of added, added more layers to, to the conversation. So, you know, there, there are a few things that carry the light, but I don't, I, I, I just put it because it's wrong, not when, you know, of course, visiting Hans Scherun, Philharmonie is, is, is another. Amazing experience that that seeing it as a as actually as a student of architecture, you know, it kind of it really actually convinced you to that actually a very interesting thing to do. Um, so I guess I already over my time. What's what to say? Yeah. <laughs> Arguments really hurts me because there's a lot of a lot of other other lines under. When I was uh, teaching at the Bartlett, like in I remember 1998, it was a year that every architect gave lecture. There were lots of uh, guest lecturers. Almost everyone, uh, if was even people, everyone said my workshop has nothing to do with aesthetics. How oh, come? You know, so basic. If I tell my brother is a scientist, he said, what? I thought it's what architects do. And but they claim that they don't generate the work through you know big consider things aesthetically. And it's true, maybe for them. But it's kind of I think it's because of this twisted twisted view. Uh, because aesthetics is also to do with subjectivity and no one is feeling comfortable with subjectivity because the way you can work and what is politically correct and what is not correct in, in days of socialism and after and it's still not kind of comfortable and today with this kind of not today like from the 90s it's kind of different type of conversation where um, you know what I call digital architect in the 90s when it was new and like to be a digital architect you were very able with kind of new software and things like that and at the beginning like any kind of new thing it was quite hard to put the self but at the, at the moment it flows of course, the self is in, and and uh, no one will convince me that it's not. So I grew up in 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 Ramat Gan, which is almost part of Tel Aviv, and um, and I I I, I visited earlier Tzvi's building, and of course this building. I think I took Peter there first time to introduce him to this building, and for me he is an expressionist architect from beginning to an end. If it's the the, the, the special inquiry, the, the, the materiality, the, you know, the fulsomeness of it, the business of it, but, but it felt very much, you know, it was highly related to living in Tel Aviv, to be kind of against bourgeois, you know, he had this relationship with the society around him, why he did, what he did, it was not just kind of coming out of the blue. And, and it, he was for years kind of obsessed with their sunflower geometry and kind of work through it with his personality, I would say. And, and uh, so he carried it further more than one, than one project. But, you know, so what's wrong with the stalactite that Pelti felt so guilty about as you went before? Um, I, think, I think this summer, I'm not sure, but I remember Tzvi Hekka told me he got this uh, drawing 
made by Max Taub, but I'm not sure. I have to check with the videos in the or somebody else. I'm not sure. Anyhow, it's behavior. Uh, and you know, I remember when I saw this Van uh, Museum in Tel Aviv, I said, Again, pets. You know, it's like so I'm haunted by you know the kind of the, the sandstone, the this kind of rough uh, texture, and, and kind of right there. And when you know more about Van Hunten, again, it's absolutely relevant, and, and, and it's another lecture. And you know, I just put some together as kind of the other, you know, as the opposite. A lot of people admire some to I think what he's doing is very beautiful, but obviously it's kind of exploring materiality to an end to a very beautiful way but being happy with kind of fairly conventional space. I think I sit next to somebody who is in my opinion expressionist. So, <laughs> you know from the end to the beginning to the end, the way he was metaphors, the way he kind of liked to think, you know, to make the to stuff like that. Oh my god, there's so much more to you read here and, and you know every project, you know, he's being led by names and titles and then wrap it all around it and and uh, enjoy designing cities like you see on the left. So I think and just now that the RA well, um, exhibition of Peter actually just finished the Royal Academy. Um, so just look at it and just for yourself, you know, right? This uh, continuing a, a tradition. So what, what I'm saying is not that it's it's just it's an ongoing thing but you know the most Others and it's not everybody and it's not, but it's a group of people. It's not just kind of one here and one there. It's a group of people. They have conversation with other and convince each other and fight with the other people who obviously hate what they do. And so I think something started with that. Look at this, and we can in '95. Stalactite like did nothing. At least it was related to the acoustics somehow, <laughs> right? And then built an amazing Scottish Parliament. Suddenly with a flower and a, and a board. Okay, so I, I reduce here the conversation, but the space is amazing, and if you see it inside, it's kind of this, again, it's kind of sculptural. Some people call it sculpture. Sculpture is a bad word. It's like, and this is, oh, your work is sculptural, it's like an insult. But, you know, it shouldn't be called sculptural, but it's still just the word is being used as a reference to <laughs> German expression, and I shouldn't say German, but it's kind of German expression. And here's, here's the Father of all, I think. You know, we all support. So <laughs> he meets all the world, you know. And it's interesting that that you know he will he if you read what he says that you know, also promotes a collaborative design strategy, collaborative, right? Uh, and it is collaborative. He actually makes a lot of workshop with, 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 the, with the clients. With, if it's a public project, he meet the public. It's amazing actually what he does. I should tell you a lot more. And, and so it's, it's not kind of detached from society as, you know, uh, as the German socialist model and wished for. And, and, and with a sense of brotherhood, it's a different kind of brotherhood, but it, it's kind of there. The richness, the fulsomeness, the, the over the top, the right thing. I think it talks for itself. He's also a painter, he enjoyed his own painting, his, you know, the building on the, the left. This is incredible, actually dentistry laboratories and they make most of the money from these uh, hovering uh, um, pods that they discover, so they're wanting to do more, you know, so straight up and down, you will say, what is that? But, um, and you know, it goes on, Eric Moss, who made the expressionist, he even used the, the words in there and there. Men will argue with me, they say, I'm not. <laughs> Absolutely not. But again, if I look and if I read what he says, you know, it, it, it's, it's, why not? So I think we all know half of the world love to hate her, half the other half love to love her and adore her. And uh, I think just the eyes will confirm. And when she finished the opera house in Guangzhou, I remember, like, people go, ah, but it's not built well, is it? Same as they talk about the dog Belzig I think so. That's my impression. Because it's actually quite incredible. <coughs> and there are also young people who I think I can categorize them. I think is it Tom Main and Helen and Hart. What do 
what's going on now for a long time actually already. It's, it's obvious that architecture has to have so many contents. So, so what? So they handle all the different contents with their value system. So we, we use different jargon. So there's a value system, you know, and it depends on which side you're of the of the of the fence you stand, which words you use, and how to use the words to make it all right. So this is Helen and Hart. And I asked Lepius for me, you know, so your art. No way! <laughs> And look what he said. Expression is possession, the manifestation of lust for dominion, for domination, sorry. I despise all such expression in him. Why? Because I think the associations and the, you know, his, what he remembers is a kind of the same fighting. And then he did amazing architecture as object. Architecture as object is still an argued issue in the world of architecture and academia. So he was so, uh, uh, yes, uh, he said, if I'm demanding to fight against the tyranny of the object, so he changed and then he said, I won't do objects anymore. So he started with lines of fields again, ended up with that amazing architecture. So when I did the book, it was about a different subject, but I found that out of 16 architects, 11 or 12, you know, I could categorize them as actually pursuing all what I said I thought was, you know, the, what was important for me from the German Expressionism at the time. So here's our friend, not my friend, which is saying. And so, so today actually it's much easier to do whatever one likes. But still the terminology is very careful, it's participatory, it's very like, this is very favored. Uh, and actually, it has a value by itself because it extends, it extends things, it extends the way we think. And I think that's it. That's the end. I just come back to that. So I like what the free said in him and something else. But the artistic permeation of the world through spatial creation is now only a question of time. So the free said, uh, quote of time. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, I just mentioned a couple of things, the additional one I'm going to say, which is that um, Archigram did not exist in a vacuum. And there are certain uh, aspects of our training or our experience before Archigram existed um, that connect to other things in architectural history. For example, uh, at the AA, I was a student of Peter Smithson. And before that, of some other people who'd been involved in Team Tan. And Bannon would come in as a critic, in fact, he was one of the critics. He was teaching up at the other place, the Barclay, which I subsequently came to be involved in, as you know. Uh, but he was brought into the A frequently and was, in fact, one of the critics on my final thesis review with Peter Smithson. Arthur Korn was an emigre who had been a member of the Ring in Berlin and uh, for a short time with Parker Mendelssohn. He was a very influential teacher in the A at the same time. So particularly in, 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 in discussing urbanism. And my late friend Ron Heron was taught by Julius Persner in, in what was then called the Hammersmith School of Building in the evening classes before Julius went back to Berlin. And David Green for a month was taught by Mr. Fuller, who visited Nottingham for a month. And Mike Webb was taught by James Sterling. Uh, I don't think he was his most important teacher, but he was certainly one of his tutors. So what I'm saying is that we didn't come from under a stone. Though we went to six different architecture schools and our ages ranged over a 10-year period. Now, Bannum, um, and, and this is the nearest picture I could find. It's a bit grainy, but in fact, it's very much like he looked. You get photographs of people who you know or knew. And, and, and they kind of are then, but they're, they're, you'll see a rather untypical one of a bit later in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bow tie. And I never saw him in a bow tie and an evening suit, but clearly there he was. This is much more what he looked like than I used to see him. I should explain that I lived across the street from him for many years, and with my former wife, we were invited to the latter stages of, of the Bannon Friday evening, where I first met many, many, I could name drop 
extensively, but from buttons to fuller upwards and downwards, uh, from fuller to tafuri and backwards. But I want to talk about Balam, and, and I want to speak from a position of a, a provincial. Now, I think in, in Germany you have a different basic structure, which you have a polynucleated, I mean, okay, you have Berlin, <laughs> but you do have a polynucleated situation, so that it is difficult to say of, let's say, Munich, that it is provincial. It has many of the, of the ambitions of being a non-provincial place, even though, well, <laughs> but um, I think I have to explain English provincialism, because I was, in fact, a multiple provincial. My father was an army officer. I moved to 12 different schools in about 10 different towns. Towns, I'm not a village person, I was a town person. And I didn't come to London until I went to the AA halfway through my architect, uh, my student career, although I started as a student at 16. I digressed. The banner comes from Norwich, and I, we have a wonderful in-house in argument about Norwich, but it is a very interesting city. Uh, I may, I show you the map of Norwich. Norwich is rather, I, I guess the, the atmosphere of East Anglia is a little bit like that of Schleswig-Holstein. Uh, and Norwich is one of those regional centers. Uh, it's flat and it's considered sort of a little bit backwards. I know that in uh, Germans, I was telling that people from Schleswig-Holstein have a piece of grass coming up there. And, uh, and, and it is said of the Norfolk, it's said of many Norfolk, uh, Norfolk characteristics. They say, oh, it's normal for Norfolk. He would be completely eccentric or outlandish, but it's normal for Norfolk. <laughs> but Norwich is therefore a regional centre and has the characteristics of a regional centre. It has a long tradition of, of music, of art. Of, it has 40 medieval, medieval churches, uh, two cathedrals, and it was a, a, a focus point. And I explain that because Mary Bannon is still alive, by the way. Uh, and she has often said that the, the Bannons, the, the family she married into, and she was a Londoner, uh, a London art teacher in fact, that, that they were chatterboxes. They were people who chatted. And certainly Bannon, his son, his daughter, who is a medievalist, and even his grandson, I don't know what's happened to him, but they're very chatty, they're very talkative, and you can find, not as famously as, as Peter Rainer Bannon, but um, and Rainer was the name of his mother's family. So he's actually Peter Banner. Rainer, but she was a Miss Rainer. But um, they were chatty and they were talkative people. And um, I think this is important. I think that a person who writes, who is also interested in people and also interested in gossip and also interested in chatter, and if you then extrapolate that to what I call a, a, a provincial situation where the chatter of East Anglia came into its capital, which is Norwich. You have a certain case, you have to put your mind into that kind of frame. Norwich is a town about the size of Munster, but it, it, it has a more regional connotation. Now, then we see a picture of an aero engine. During the Second World War, Bannon was an engineer on aero engines at Bristol Aeroplane. And his father had been a gas engineer. So, and I think this is very, very important. And he, he I don't know exactly what he did on the engines, but he, he worked on aero engines. And then he went back to Norwich, and you see a picture of him early, and, and then you see the Manor Market Theatre, which is where he met his wife, Mary, and they were working, I think, in an amateur sense, of, of, of doing props for the theatre. So he came to it from sort of engineer point, he came to it as an artist. Uh, and then um, they married him, he came to London, and whilst he attended the Court of Arts Institute, she worked in a shop, as far as I know. She also lost a leg by gangrene quite early on, and some many years ago celebrated, had a party to celebrate 50 years without a leg. Uh, I think it's now 60 years without a leg, but this is quite a, she's a st strong, strong individual. Now, the row of houses, you see, the red brick houses, in fact, as it happens, only three streets away from where we live now. Uh, and I lived with my former wife in that same street. Bannon was diagonally across the road. One time, uh, he had noticed an archigram, and then his, his wife 
said to my wife, uh, we have these things on Friday evening when you come across. And I was the youngest person. I was in awe of all these people who have been famous people or my teachers. And then he, and, and so we got to know him really very well. And then he got this uh, job in America, went off to Buffalo, which is a terrible place. His wife hated it because it, she couldn't handle the lake. And, and I remember staying with them and they hated it. But, and then they moved to California. And you see Bannon in one of his characteristic poses on the desert. Now he became very, and, and of course he did the definitive book. Um, yeah, sorry, I've jumped ahead. <laughs> this is the picture of the Madam Market Theatre. The young Bannon and Bannon in, in the desert. And of course, in fact, he did the definitive book on the ecologies of, of Los Angeles. Everybody expected him to be hired by one of the Los Angeles uh, universities, particularly USC, where he was frequently visiting, but it never happened. And he ended up in Santa Cruz, which is a lovely place, but a bit off. off there. And I think that his, his, his sort of summers or whatever that he spent in London were always a recharge. Coming back to Europe was a sort of recharging operation because really Santa Cruz, lovely is not. You don't get a lot of throughput of, of interesting people. Now, also the time that I knew him the most, uh, he, he became, after the book, this book was originally his PhD thesis. And it, in some ways, still reads like a PhD thesis. It's incredibly dense. It came out about, I don't remember exactly, about three or four years after I graduated from there. It was the first book that I had the money to, to buy. And it was heavy going. And it's still heavy going. I've just in the last days been reading it maybe for the fourth time. It's normally a book which I can't handle more than about one chapter. It's very, very dense. It's incredibly dense with information. Every page has about ten interesting things, as it's saying. There's, there's no waffle. Um, and that, 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 you know, his great thing was really, were his articles in an article in, in a magazine called New Statesman, and then latterly in, in New Society, which covered mostly, uh, almost everything. He used to write, write about the latest cafe that had opened up in the immediate high street, or he would write about uh, four mica fried eggs, or he would write about car bumpers, or here, I don't know what the article was, but Rainer Man on mock skeletons. I mean, these were typical. Uh, and he was still the Norwich gossip, in many ways, despite the layering of, of the quarter and, and, and so on. And he would write about Barbarella, and he would write about the Brutus, because, in fact, um, the Smithsons were regular <coughs> Friday nighters, as was James Sterling, except the Smithsons and James Sterling sort of didn't really <laughs> talk much. But I, I digress. <laughs> about that. And, but I, I mention that because I think underlying his sort of correctness as an incre as, as a as a English provincial grammar school SWAT. <laughs> think about it. Uh, which I suppose I want to be it, but less for SWAT than him. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a certain it is a certain category of English intellectual. And even he it'll come up in, 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 in some something he wrote in the book even. Uh, so on one hand he is He's attempting to, to do a correct assessment of, of, of modernism. But in a way, he's also talking about people, and I'll come back to that at the end. And he starts the structure of the book, chapters 1 to 7. He, 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 he puts his, his little chapters into groups. The first group is called Predisposing Causes, Academic and Rationalist Writers. And he, there's quite a lot about, about uh, Guadet and Chozzi. Uh, it, and and in, in, in a sense, it underlines the basis of the book in, in, in that he, uh, Guadet was preoccupied by composition and Chozzi, and Chozzi by construction. This, this dichotomy crops up the whole of the way through the book. So that, for example, when, we, when discussing Perrin, he's drawing attention to the fact that the, the, the famous uh, block by Perret was using the figuration of, of 
concrete in the way that it might have been timber, traditionally. Uh, I, I just put a little, a little aside here into, into a little schwazy uh, diagram of Norwich Cathedral, because in fact, in his hometown, the flying buttress was characteristic of this cathedral, it's an amazing flying buttresses. So he was growing up with this sort of coming one year, and I think my, my just as Jan has suggested, that, that we, we should not deny uh, emotive reactions. I think that equally, in the case of Bannon, he should, we should not deny the fact that he was a Norfolk guy, he was a chatty guy, he did do aero engines, he did get into art late, and, and, and therefore his, his predilection, so he's attempting to be the, 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 the kind of the um, objective scholar, nonetheless, in fact, this underscores the whole book. Uh, he, the other thing is because that he was the student of Mixus Pearson, Pearson was his supervisor, and Pearson was a very big expert on the Farkas factory. And, and it's one of those funny things that happens to you if you're the student of somebody who's a powerful person. You, have, you hear all the chit-chat, but perhaps you're agreeing and perhaps you are not. It's almost, you know, it's almost a, a sort of pistol to your head, you know, do you follow the line or don't you? Now, I don't know what Pevsner really, I haven't read what Pevsner really wrote in depth about the Parkers factory, but certainly in the book, Bannon draws considerable attention to the difference between its, its, its kind of neoclassical conditions and the more exciting sort of physical conditions that, to which attention is normally drawn. drawn. And he would come back to Pilsig and, and to Berg and the Jahantzhalle and, and Gropius vis-a-vis -vis the Expressionists uh, sort of tempted a little bit, as I read it, by the Expressionists but never really followed much more, had pulled back to um, Guadet, really. And Pelsig, and, and, and in, in the book, Ballon draws attention to the way in the, uh, the Lubin factory is actually following the organization of the factory. This is expression that comes from a certain kind of, of, of applied mechanics elementalism. And elementalism crops up a lot in the book as well. There's a lot about the Futurist Manifesto, rereading it. Um, the first one says, um, you know, well, this is only really uh, suddenly a Chetoni is, is, is interesting. Um, and we, we, we know all that, but he, he, devote, he, he devoted three little chapters to futurists. Uh, and I think more from the point of view that their statements uh, catapulted a whole lot of other movements. That it, it isn't just and it isn't just the, the kind of posturing of Marinetti and, and so on and so forth in his writing, but it, the statement was so, if you like, shrill, so developed that, that other, other movements had to, to write on. I've got various notes that will appear on the screen at some point. I won't let you read them all out, but they are, in a sense, of a memoir. This is the picture part, uh, where also then, later in the book, he comes to discuss the degree to which art movements were involved in the discussion space and in the discussion dynamic. In chapters 11 to 14, basically called Holland, the legacy of Belaka, the Stil, he, he develops also some conversations about the degree to which Belaka was looking at Frank Lloyd Wright and to what extent Frank Lloyd Wright was therefore accepted or recognized, again it's one of these things that Jan brought up about, the degree to which something is or is not recognized, is chosen not to be recognized. And he, he, he points to a certain, or implies to some extent, that at a certain point the European scene did not want to hear any more about Frank Lloyd Wright. And I certainly remember myself in, 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 in the small school that I attended before I went to the AA, um, that Mies, Cor, Gropius, and Wright were the four you had to know about. But Mies and Cor were really the discussion, and Wright was sort of pushed 
a bit into the background. And anyhow, Grotius was never as talented, but that's another conversation. Uh, I'm cutting a lot of corners here. But, um, and then the, the obvious conversation, which I'm sure most of you know, the, the discussion between the two wings of, of, of Dutch influence the, the, the Klerk and the other expressionists on the one hand, and the Stiel on the other hand. And of course, then a whole series of chapters, these are little chapters, don't forget, um, uh, chapters 15 to 18, which discuss Paris, the world of art, and Le Corbusier. And he makes much uh, emphasis upon the fact that the core really emerged through this connection with Mr. Osenfant, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Osenfant, something, uh, and, and his studio. And in fact, there I show a Corbusier painting. I think it's reasonable to say that Corbusier was a pretty good painter, but not a fantastic <laughs> painter. Uh, and a great deal of discussion on, from and um, again on the development out of the, the kind of studio tradition of, of Paris, which is why I show an Henri Lassat building, and, and, and a considerable discussion of the Chaudacan early house, in fact, saying that it, that it's concluding that in fact it is actually much more uh, progressive than it's normally, it's normally sort of put down as a call doing his early work, but in fact it was a pretty extraordinary house in terms. And then at the end of the book, chapters 19 to 22, is the victory of the new style. Uh, ending really in, in, in Buckminster Fuller, uh, where at the time that he did the book, Bucky was a frequent visitor to uh, Aberdeen Gardens, I don't know. Certainly I first met Bucky at the Bannon's house. And um, so the, this, this last section involves then a discussion uh, that Gropius and Meyer's Chicago Tribune returns to a kind of uh, Schwarzy situation. And Mies goes nearly to expressionism at this point, and then later pulls back into a kind of classicism. And he draws attention to Clay, the drawer, as having considerable insight in, into these things. Now, Here's one of my note-ridden pages. Um, so I think I come, the first section of analysis, I have three or four sections. One is to, 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 to look and see to what extent mechanical issues, bearing in mind he was an aero, aero engine, engineer, mechanical issues, technology, deal with space. Uh, he, he goes to some extent to discuss Mutasius, he goes to some extent to clar the clarity of Schwazi and the fact that he, he, he jumps onto the fact, he said, the leaders of, of German architectural thought deplored the application of artwork to engineering structures, but wanted to, to conjure aesthetics into them. Behrens, Matus, Matus, Mies and Gropius were less formally inventive than Percy, Berg, Albert Marx, and a guy who, I must admit, one doesn't hear of very often, Heinrich Stoffregen, I think, and also being the sort of provincial schoolboy. I mean, one or two of my other colleagues, in fact, Warren Short used to always say, yeah, the problem with Bannon is that he's a, he's a bit of a schoolboy. I think Warren was more drawn, uh, it was more attracted by people like Colin Rowe, who, who, who was not schoolboyish. But Bannon was still eager, he would discover funny things, he would get excited about them. Uh, and I think that was his, his, the great thing about his, his contribution. Um, so that uh, he admits already in, 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 the, in chapter 5 that Percy was more inventive almost at the end of the conversation. 
And there's no doubt he was more inventive. So here we have a, a kind of bridge with the earlier conversation of this discussion to what extent inventiveness is to do with the spirit and to do with the individual. And, 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 and the rational people get nervous when they find themselves becoming too inventive. But that, that's, a, that's a kind of a statement of position for me. I, I uh, so the Gropius would cite grain silos and bunkers and so on. But to what extent he would go the whole park is the, is the really question. And then uh, Balaam, I think, is delighted to, to quote Lewis, who says, engineers are noble savages. Don't forget he did be an engineer himself. Um, and of course then there's the wonderful symbolism of the car track in the land. Continuing on this, this, this theme of mechanical issues, technology and place, uh, he is excited to report that in, in the Futurist Manifesto, because there's, there's great rhetoric about the machine, tremendous rhetoric about the machine, uh, but also, a certain points a certain irony that you know that even Santa Lea occasionally gave functional justification to his inventions, calling them lighthouses, villas, or such. Uh, and then points interesting, and I'm on Friday going to in another place at the market and then talk about Ulbrich, and he he po points out the influence of the temporary structure that Ulbrich made. Uh, the entrance, which was already a kind of hanging tension structure. Now, this is the early days. We think of Ulrich as a fruity character, but in fact, he's also interested in structure. Uh, and at the same time, the, the right-hand picture, which is of the, of the uh, I suspect it's an exhibition. It's not very well explained in, off the internet. Uh, an exhibition or an installation or a salon, maybe, of the group de Pateur. The, the, the Duchamps. It doesn't look very Duchampian. It looks rather French bourgeois. And that, I think that's, things like that are interesting giveaways that, that, that against the positioning of some of these groups was, was very near the surface of bourgeois origin. Uh, and then he has another quote, I think, I'm not quite sure who it's from. Geometry, the thumbprint of modernism. That goes right back to to uh, And then continuing this theme of Bannon the mechanist looking not only at mechanics but mechanics of mechanics. Um, where he quotes Le Corbusier is talking a lot about the Maison fabriquée en scène, but it, and it but then mixes the mechanical and the classical. So even Corbus is held, is looking back to Schwarzy and and what it. Uh, and he says after his pavilion the spring of Corb writes in a futurist tone, but still refutes the futurist ideas of such things as Kantishita. That works of art should be perishable. He, he call, will talk about it, but then pulls back from certain implications. Uh, the mechanisms of personal connection. Now, this interests me because I think Bannon, again, is the Norwich gossip, and certainly the London gossip, was always talking about how so and so was a tough character, so and so was a you know, haven't got killer instinct or so and so. Well, he happened to be in the right place at the right time. And he, he enjoyed that, that lap of between gossip and circumstance and the mechanics of circumstance. And certainly, subsequently, as a teacher and a traveller around the world, I'm fascinated by that too. I find myself fascinated by whatever happened to my students, why they do what they do, who they know, who they have chosen to know, who they have chosen to hang out with how somebody didn't just happen to be in the right place at the right time, but contrived to be in the right place at the right time. Where somebody, a little bit slow moving, missed the point of being in the right place at the right time. 
And I think this is, this is underestimated as, as the mechanics of how architecture moves. You know, certain, okay, the, the, the sort of busybody types are always everywhere at the right place, but haven't got a clue what it's about. I'm talking about the people who have got a clue what it's about, how they can consciously position themselves to, to make some effect. And I, I think it's easy to brush that under the carpet and say they're just superficial. No, it is part of the game. It is part of the operation. But I, I haven't been personal about this. I mean, what's interesting is to, to pick around the banner book and to see uh, where, these, uh, where these mechanisms occur. So, for example, even in chapter one, he's talking about the academic influence of Godet upon many people. Uh, he says, then, these are really just notes, but could be boring, but I'm trying to make them less boring. But Perret and, and, and Garnier both were pupils of Choisy. Though the prime mode of their designs was composition, so they were followers of the, of the structural kind, but they were com composers, back to, to the other point. Uh, the tarp was employed by the, I, I suppose, I'm trying to figure uh, my German is not the style of the uh, steel work, something, whatever. And Bruno Paul came ahead of a, of a, of a technical school. <laughs> and Lewis had great personal influence. I'll come on to that again. Uh, and then Berlaka had various direct connections, private connections through to other scenes. Continuing that theme, uh, the still consciously part of international art movements. Uh, but an interesting one, he points out that Van Dersburg remains the only person from the old guard of the Stiel who's continue to circulate. So this, this, this is a positioning right for um, And of course then there are events, so there are these big meetings like the Exposition Art Decorative where all the internationals come in, or the creation of the ring and Van der Rohe's attention to the fact that it wasn't just one kind of art, the ring was actually Look at the list of people, quite a, quite a broad church. But perhaps there are certain moments in historical time when you need to club together. I remember one occasion, and they dropped now, but, but when I think Daniel Lipscomb was being criticised for something, um, Wolfbrick said to me, We have to hang together. Mm -hmm. I know she doesn't agree with everything that Lipscomb does, probably less so now than then. But he says, At a certain point, we have to hang together because most of the world hates what we do. I've been aware of that myself right from early on. I know there are more people out there who don't like what I do than like what I do. That gives you a certain strength, but you do have to create alliances. And which is why an archigram we often had work done by people in other places. We, 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 we made this sort of un, unspoken gang and how we found that in, in Japan, in particular, uh, there were more allies than there were in London. But I digress. And so he, 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 he really points to the, the, the contribution of Mahay Nash, not only in what he wrote and what he did, but his Russian connections. He brought a, another wind into the thing. And then also, in a sense, the three uh, authors that Yarrow mentioned were, were, were misunderstanding uh, expressions. And, the, the, and, and Bannon says that as the number of people who like uh, Mumford and 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 um, uh, the other people as as these people who were based in, in the United States or based in Switzerland or whatever started to get involved, they were they were outside the core conversation, and it got and the thing got thinned up. Always missed the point. Always missed the point. And then my final categorization is. Uh, in terms of m movements and influences, uh, to come back to what was his key, the key structure of the book. The key structure of the book was discussing the academic tradition. And then this, this contrast between rationalism and technique. And then the kind of academic succession basically, through, through France. And then the way in which the English 
um, went over. Uh, the English uh, sort of this detached thing, uh, this detachment, uh, and, and I think possibly surprised that Mutasius was so interested in what they did, uh, which Fanon sort of hints at it certainly. And the degree to which the factory aesthetic was actually a, a, a kind of organic aesthetic and, or was an applied aesthetic. I think we might just go to check. Yes, go ahead. Um, and the rest of the structure we've been through, um, he discusses the Dutch. I notice, for example, that he very much probably in order to keep control of his, his PhD thesis, this tended to home in on places. So we get Paris, we get Berlin, we get the, the, uh, the Italian situation, in order to sort of hold on to things. As he's starting to, you can see at the end of the book, where he's starting to get interested in what was going on in America, let's almost the time to stop and in fact that would become much more of his territory after the book. Bearing in mind the book was still fairly early in his career. And we see there a, the funny photograph of Van, which I don't ever remember him really looking at. But, but it's interesting for me historically because uh, in the sense that Pentonum was such this, this towering influence in, in, in the UK that he, he fell in you know, this, this Russian-German Jew fell in love with England, having arrived there, and then goes around the countryside documenting every building you could possibly think of, and obviously being a very powerful influence. Um, and there's Bannon. I suspect the venue is, is either the Bartlett or the Kulshild Institute, and they have glasses of probably rather second-rate white wine in their hands. Bannon looking a bit stiff in his... his, uh, his uh, bow tie, and I noticed that John Summerson, who was our uh, history of architecture teacher, was absolutely brilliant, and has a similar cap, though coming from a, coming from a Scottish rather more, more, not as aristocratic, but a certainly different kind of background, um, uh, uh, was probably much more comfortable in these glass in hand situations, and is not wearing a bow tie, just wearing a tie that he might be wearing that day. But he was also... Uh, the man, having come from a small provincial school into London, having every week John Summerson talking about his enthusiasm, realizing that, that uh, neoclassical architecture, Renaissance architecture, which I hadn't been that interested in as a student, uh, had, had loves and hates and, and brilliances and boredoms and gossip. And if you read Georgia London, it has some of the same, in, in, in my mind, some of the same slightly chatty uh, position. He talks about somebody being gay, or somebody being a bit of a shyster, or somebody being a bit of an opportunist, or so. things like that, in a very beautiful, wonderful book. Uh, I mention this again, I'm not sure, I don't really speak German, I'm not sure to what extent kind of gossip is enjoyed by the German. Uh, critical tradition, because the English do, or the English and the Scottish do, certainly Bannon and Summerson, different though they were, enjoyed that. I know, because I used to hear them. <laughs> uh, and, it, 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 and then finally I, I, I come on to just a, just a throwaway list, glean from the book about some chatty observation. Go on, led a life of blameless respectability. Now, it's only a single sentence, but you just look at the face of the guy and you hear that phrase. Yeah, okay, got him. Got, got, got him for this. Or Shazi was a man of very fine presence, with something military about him. Immediately, you look at his face yeah, right, it's stiff bugger. Uh, or, or, or Perry became elevated to the rank of patron of architecture. Imagine glowing these young guys, like the person, the person so buzzing around him. Or Mutesis, uncomfortably like a 19th century politician trying to enlist liberal support for some military enterprise. I think that's a wonderful sentence. So just stop and think about it. 
Is that, oh, okay, okay. Uh, or left me a mad feeling. Now, in the English, that's all you need to say. A mad feeling. <laughs> and then you look at his sort of, his, his extremely large moustache. You see a funny, slightly boating hat. You remember the pictures at the beginning. Uh, Lowe's, of course, much documented these issues, but personal, sporadic, and not always serious in terms. Turbulent, combative, contradictory, turning personal quarrels into public crusades. But of course he was Austrian, for Christ's sake. I mean, every Austrian I know is like that. Uh, old Van Dersberg, busy circulator. You know, obviously familiar with having a glass of wine in his hand. Uh, and, 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 um, Elder Sitsky, not another slightly one. Yeah, Elder Sitsky, persuasive but a quite unspectacular. Sorry, persuasive but a quite unspectacular personality. Now that is English comment as it's spelled. <laughs> a quite unspectacular personality. <laughs> like t a talented bore, basically. Um, I've always been fascinated by Mallet Stevens. I don't know much about him, but I'm sure he was an interesting, fruity character. Uh, he doesn't say much about it, except that he quotes something where Mallet Stevens is commenting on something happening to them. It was completely wrong. The dates were not nice. Dates were not his strong point. <laughs> so you get, you meet him, then you look at the guy in his Rolls Royce, and you say, yeah, he was a, he was a skillful dilettante, you know, maybe. Uh, and I love this stuff. Uh, and, and a very useful one, bearing in mind that Bannon was, was very English, of, of, of uh, Scott, saying, English judgment, clouded by romantic, picturesque, naturalistic, mechanical, ethical, and biological fallacies. <laughs> uh, but in the end, it is the, the conclusion of, of the Bannon book, and I think a sad conclusion from his own sort of part, that there was a failure of architecture really to be of the machine age. It, it played with it. Now, we connected particularly with him at the time when Archigram did its first ever public event, which was a, a strange thing on the cliff tops in the town called Folkestone. And by that time, Bannon, all we had to put on the poster was Bannon will be there. It was a, a period when he was extremely, you know, that would pull in about 200 extra people. He said Bannon will be there. We hoped that Bucky would be there, but he didn't make it. But it was the first time that Holine and, and uh, Parent Aurelio, obviously Cedric Price, uh, a few other, uh, Fiona Friedman, actually came over to England and we all did this strange manifestation. The books that then subsequently Rainer Banner did largely were to do with America or were to do with um, uh, appliances, equipment, air circulation, and so on. They never quite had the importance that I think theory of design had, but they were where his heart was, and continued to be. Very much with uh, 
with Alan's pocket why we, we have tolerated each other for so long, uh, uh, that uh, I, I feel very much this point that she centrally makes, which is there has been a continued battle between correctness and, and self-expression in architecture. And I think it continues. Usually, in both of our countries, the, the expressionists are put down. If we just look at the amount of mere rational building, or minimal building, or boring building, <laughs> there is out there. And, and one of my pet hates at the moment is what I call English biscuit architecture, <laughs> which is something. It's just got windows like that. They look like biscuits. Uh, and a lot of stuff in Germany. Um, the the, uh, the anti-rationists usually win out. But until in some corner of the scene or the world or talent, there's a, an outburst again. And I think if I can dig up old conversations, I think uh, Matthias Ungers, though he was a friend of, of Jim Sterling, I think always had problems about Jim. Because just when you could pin him down, he would go off in a, on a tangent and be naughty. And I think he enjoyed being naughty. Uh, but that's another conversation. But I, I think. Uh, to me, expressionism is about inventiveness. And I think it's inventiveness that, that, is, that is also embarrassing a lot of people. They want you to do the correct thing, you know? not, not, not be too tiresome. But do you feel that the, uh, the technological possibilities of today enable a more Expressionist oh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. I mean, but, but, uh, we could not have built Graz in the Archigram days. We could have built it if you'd had you know, 100 Nubian slaves and, 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 and lots of scaffolding. <laughs> but we didn't. Uh, but we did have computers. And, and that enabled you to stretch the pieces of plastic and, and, uh, and so on. I mean, it's still a craft building, basically. But yeah, sure. And, and, and I think there's a loop, because I think that's why it was great that Yell showed some of the current things going on in the digital world, which is it is possible to weave almost anything. Uh, and I think that if some of that stuff started to grow on top of our existing cities, there would be up, up crime, but it would be wonderful. But Almost, I feel, is a major part of the architectural world that doesn't want it to happen, even though you know it can happen, because it's kind of naughty and embarrassing and hairy and, and so on. <laughs> uh, Are there any questions from the audience? Everybody is uh, <laughs> deep in thought because it was quite a like I said, a very interesting way of going from the book into, into today or into the 